Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and it's a trip to the ocean state and a conversation with Morgan Snyder, the head brewer and co-founder of Buttonwoods Brewery. From world-class small batch lagers to an expansion to the wonder of Cezanne, we cover it all and more. But first, please go visit allaboutbeer.com. There you can find original articles, reviews, news, insights, and podcasts. Listen to shows like Brewer to Brewer and the All About Beer podcast simply by searching All About Beer wherever you listen to shows. Don't forget, you can follow All About Beer on Instagram, Threads, and X, and Facebook at All About Beer. And you can keep up with all of the great smoked beer news out there, as well as new releases by checking out This Week in Rauk Beer. Search the group by name on Facebook or follow at TWRaukBeer on X Threads and Instagram. Glassware and apparel is available too on allaboutbeer.com slash merch. This show and all of the work we do, it's supported by you. Please go visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. A few bucks goes a long way to help keep the content fresh and to fund writers, photographers, creators, and editors. And if you'd like to learn more about advertising on this show or any of our shows, please email info at allaboutbeer.com. A few weeks back, I found myself in Rhode Island, specifically Providence. It's become a great beer city over the last few years, building upon the legacy of early entrance into the state's craft scene. Buttonwoods is just south of the city, and it had been put on my radar earlier thanks to a really excellent mild that I drank last year and a recommendation to visit in person by some Jersey guys that I know. The outside of the brewery in Cranston is not great. It's a torn up parking lot against a building that looks like it's barely being held together. Inside, however, is another story. The brewery tap room is a lovely, welcoming space. It's like being in a well-thought-out loft living room. The beers are outstandingly good. Lagers, Cezanne, small beers are all expertly crafted with great thought and turned out on a three and a half barrel system. Morgan Snyder is the brewer and co-founder and happened to be in the tasting room that afternoon. Over several rounds of Pilsners and bottles of Cezanne, he shared the story of the brewery and told us that it would soon be leaving its original location in favor of one in Providence. Snyder cut his teeth in beer distribution and then moved on to be an assistant brewer at the Bronx Brewery. Buttonwoods opened up in 2016, and they've been brewing exceptional beers and gaining a local following ever since. This show was recorded a few days after that in-person visit. Here's our conversation. Morgan, thanks for being on the show. I, Since visiting... I guess now just a couple of weeks back, um, I've had your brewery on my mind since. And there, there's very clearly Jersey bias that exists in my mind where I don't often think of Rhode Island. And when I do, it's you know <laughs> quickly dismissive, uh, even though that's really not fair to your great small state. Um, and it's especially true with the beer and hanging out at your brewery was you know, one of the better beer experiences that I've had in, 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 in quite some time, um, you know, state notwithstanding, but pretty much everywhere else I went in Rhode Island as well. Like there's, there's a really cool beer culture, local beer culture that exists. And I'm wondering from your vantage point at Buttonwoods of what the state is like these days and you know, why jerks like me should not be uh, so quickly dismissive. Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, you know, you mentioned not thinking about Rhode Island, but to be fair, I think most of the country doesn't think about Rhode Island half the time. They think we're just Long Island. Um, So (laughs) we're a Boston suburb. Yeah. Yeah. To be overlooked is the natural chip on a Rhode Island shoulder. Um, But I mean, I, the, the thing is like, we have such a great state in general. And so to have a great beer scene was only kind of the, the next step. And, it's really been an evolution um when you think about it like the beer scene i mean you know we have narragansett and we've had narragansett since uh for forever they closed the cranston brewery back in i think the 80s and then they revitalized early 2000s so they kind of have been a constant um despite not always being here um 
but then sometime around like the early the 90s we had brew pubs that have popped up that are for the most part still here and Trinity, still yeah Trinity, yeah union station uh yep. Coddington brew pub like those guys were very much on the early stages to so kind of you, you ask anyone who's been to college here they've they've all they've all drank at trinity brew house <laughs> yeah um so it's just kind of ingrained in the overall culture of, of drinking here but really in the last like 10 years you know, with uh, with Proclamation, Tilted Barn, uh, and in Long Live, and and other breweries really popping up, we kind of had a this like low key, really great beer scene that some of Massachusetts noticed, and uh, Connecticut sometimes was like, oh, there's good beer here. Um, but I feel, especially recently, with like all the, the you know, Rhode Island actually in and of itself is having a housing boom. Uh, a lot of people are are moving here because of, of mobility. Uh, by working from home. So we're seeing a lot of out of staters who are suddenly realizing, hey, there's really good beer here in, in Rhode Island. Um, so it's it's kind of the story of Rhode Island. We're, we're a sleeper state. We've got beautiful beaches, beautiful everything. And when people finally realize it, it kind of blows up and uh, in the in the best possible way. So um, yeah, is there is it among those breweries that you mentioned, is there a connective tissue that binds Rhode Island brewers together? Um, strangely, no. Um, I mean, you know, for a small state, we're all, we're all very separated in an interesting way. Um, it's more of that kind of serendipitous moment of like these, all the three breweries I mentioned kind of all opened up within about three years of each other. Um, I mean, even we were, uh, year four in that that group um but it was just kind of that the the nation you know a whole country was seeing a pop-up of breweries that were doing really great stuff and they we kind of followed suit um but really it was all everyone was doing these ideas separate from each other and um kind of was that perfect storm of everyone opening up and doing really great things that open up the doors for people to to really get excited about the craft beer scene here allowed for people like myself to open up uh, Smug in Pawtucket, um, you know, Moniker, who's I think two years, three years old now. Yeah. Time is not real anymore. Um, <laughs> or, Origin Beer Project. Um, you know, we, we have such, for small state, we've got 36 breweries and most of them are pretty freaking good. So, yeah. No, I've just, I, I, as I said, you know, when, when we were together in person and just, you know, I, and I'll say it again right now, it's just, I, overall, the quality of, beer and for the majority of places that I've visited has been and the aesthetics of places and the thoughtfulness behind the you know the business itself um really sort of stands out as opposed to you know maybe some other states where it's just sort of this cookie cutter or yeah we're gonna open and we're gonna have some hazies and you know people show up and that kind of thing and it's I don't know it 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 does seem that there's a lot of intention behind the beer and the breweries and I guess w w with that in mind, when you envisioned Buttonwoods before it opened, is it what you thought it would be, like as it is today? Uh, yes and no. Um, if I'm being honest, like I, so I have such a fondness for uh, uh, saisons. Um, that's kind of the beer style that, like, really kind of was my aha moment of understanding beer in general and, and why it was so much more unique than some other spirits and, and alcohols. Um, so when, when we opened up Buttonwoods, the intention was to have a pretty strong focus on, on clean and mixed fermentation saisons. And uh, it was, you know, back in, I think this, so this is 2017 and right around that time, people were still excited about mixed firms, but you could kind of see like people were starting to lose interest. They, there was a lot of, not understanding why everything was so sour and um I, i've heard a lot of belgian producers say that the the american flavor of sour is just acetic acid um <laughs> and, and i can i can say there's there was a lot of there was a lot yeah no there was a lot of imbalance yeah yeah um so i think that that kind of you know it was tough for a lot of people who were trying to do that and the, it was even harder to educate the consumers like this beer sour for these reasons um, and then around that same time, you started seeing the, the heavily fruited uh, Ber Berliner Weisses or whatever they're calling them these days um, that kind of really 
took the wind out of the sails for that. So we really shifted in that moment. And um, it's kind of, we'd always had a Pilsner available and it was seeing that the saisons that I loved and put a lot of care and attention to were not getting the the same kind of love and attention that I wanted. I was like, well, you know, we make a decent Pilsner. What if we just kind of leaned into that? Cause that's, that's what I drink on the daily anyways. Yeah. Um, you know, keeping moving one passion to another passion and kind of driving the ship forward. So, um, yeah, about 2018, we shifted our focus more towards loggers. I mean, we still do, um, our main drivers, hazy IPAs because the new England, it's new England IPA is just called an IPA around here. You, you can't operate without one. Right. Um, so, you know, that was the main driver. It's got people in the door and then they would shift to our Pilsner, um, or whatever lager we had available on tap. Like right now we have a Shores beer. Uh, we have a malt liquor. We have, a. <laughs> I'll, I'll frankly say it a Miller high life clone, yeah. um, which is, I've been drinking a lot of that. Um, and that's with a local restaurant as well. Yes. Yes. So it's a, yeah. Yeah. It's a local bar called Royal Bobcat. Um, they're great. Love them. And uh, they, they kind of very much an industry bar. And, and so it only made sense to kind of, make an industry beer like Miller high life. Yeah. Um, so it's a corn lager, basically 18 IBUs, super just infinitely crushable. But yeah, so we kind of shifted and focused and put our attention into that. And that's kind of, that was our differentiator. You know, you mentioned um, how everyone in Rhode Island has, is very intentional and, and there's a uniqueness to each of us. And it's, I think it's a lot of that proximity and, um, you know, we're all so close to each other and you need to, Rhode Islanders don't really want to travel more than 15 minutes. So you have to give the the consumer a justification for traveling that extra minute from their house. So, you know, we kind of, we have, with the IPA, we also pushed uh, lagers. So it's like, well, you go to any of these breweries in Providence at the time and you get these wonderful, beautiful double IPAs, IPAs, hoppy goodness. But if you come to us, you can get hoppy goodness and a Pilsner. So I was just trying to get people to come outside of outside of Providence and what? and up past the towers. Uh, there are two Rhode Island references that maybe five people will get. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was just gonna let it. I was gonna let that pair sail by without uh, <laughs> uh, acknowledging it. But I'm, I'm wondering though, like, is, is a Miller High Life clone or an homage? Is that is that enough to actually get people walking through the door? Because it seems counterintuitive to. I don't know, like the old school idea of craft, right? Like when you think about, you know, Trinity and, you know, some of those other early brewer pubs where they were going so far away from what was mainstream. Well, I, I wouldn't say that the, the homage to Miller High Life is really kind of the thing that gets people in the door, but what it, what it does is it allows our draft list to look um, more interesting. Cause I, you know, Hazy IPAs, whether you, you you like them or not, are still such a strong driver in the market around here um, that it's you, you have to have them on the menu. And a lot of people um, will fill the board up and have almost all hazy IPAs with a few other options. But my goal is to have more of like a hopefully closer to a 60-40 split or less of IPA to other things so that that Miller High Life homage kind of holds a place on the draft list that people can come in here as like, Oh, this is this is great. Like I can, I don't have to drink an IPA if I don't want to. There are options that I can fit my my palate and my preference rather than kind of just trying to find something on the list that I like, even though I'm not an IPA drinker. You know, because that gotcha. is it's very strong thing still. People are, um, especially modern craft beer, is people are like, eh, well, I, I've had about 150 IPAs this month. I want not that right now. So you know, I think that's what what it really holds as a place is just makes it more interesting to the consumer. So I want to get back to Cezanne's, but we're on this lager, this, this lager train now. So um, when I was there at the brewery, I drank the high life homage. I drank the uh, Italian pills, which was excellent. And then I had some more on the train on the ride home. And then uh, was uh, same thing with your malt liquor as well in those uh, stubby eleven ounce bottles, which I thought was 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 kind of fun as well. And what struck out to me on all of your lockers was the soft touch of the malt 
there's a little nice there, there there's always just that snap of hot bitterness um and just hit that refreshing quality that you look for where the beer where a lager just kind of melds into the background right it, it's just it's there you're enjoying it you don't have to overthink it and that's been i think the great trick of some of the best lager producers on the in in in, in the country in the world is that it it's really pleasant background noise that occasionally grabs your attention but doesn't want to you know demand the spotlight and maybe in the way that some IPAs do um and with all of those compliments thrown at you what thoroughly amazes me is that you're making these on a three and a half barrel system yeah <laughs> how well, you, you you didn't even you didn't even actually see the three and a half system. no no i didn't i didn't uh, walk in the back because i was i was too busy enjoying the beers like i, I don't necessarily need to know how the sausage was made then yeah but now i'm asking yeah and and it's um i i have to bring it up because it's it's i will it's just something that lives rent free in my brain is that we have this single wall electric system so it's not very well insulated um so yeah i mean it's just it's it's been a real um you know we kind of opened on a very lean budget um just the goal was to get open and then hopefully um uh, get to an expansion phase and and build out a new uh, add a new brew house um and we were we were very much on that trajectory right around year 3 but as everyone knows year 3 was uh 2020 and that kind of yeah. curbed some momentum there so um, but yeah, so this single wall system, the, the mash sun itself, uh, had a temperature swing of five degrees. So it's covered in orange fireproof spray insulation. So it just, <laughs> it just looks like a blob, um, just sitting there and it's, it solved their temperature swing problem. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's, I call it our Fisher price. Um, cause it, it just feels like a, <laughs> it, it just feels like a kid system. Um, especially so I, before I opened the brewery, I was run, I was working at a 20 barrel brew house. Uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's DME, the Canadian uh, manufacturer yep. I'm blanking on the name. Yeah. Um, that's so, one of know, the Canadian would, manufacturers. Yeah. 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 That's DME feels right. Um, but yeah, so they, they kind of, we had this huge three vessel, like beautiful system. And then I opened my own brewery and it's like, uh, this is great system to make beer, but it is so far underdeveloped comparative to this 20 barrel system. Um, so it was, it was, it was a fun first year figuring out the kinks and there's, there's still plenty. Um, but thankfully we're, uh, we put down the money. We have a 10 barrel brew house. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what, it, what, if the, if there was a little bit of magic in that, that three and a half system, or if we can still make good beer on the 10. <laughs> well, so I, I mean, loggers one, I mean, take time. Um, I think there's an argument that that can be made for larger batches are um, somewhat easier to make um, than some of the smaller ones. Um, uh, but I mean, how do you approach maybe, you know, that, that might just be my own opinion, but like there's, how do you approach brewing lagers on a three and a half barrel system? And are you doing anything different than maybe you would have on the old 20 barrel that you were working on? Um, I mean, it's the big thing is, is from like a, just a overall like standpoint is, is, is keep it simple. Um, you know, lagers have been around for, uh, this, like practically brewing have been brewed for hundreds of years. And they weren't kind of pulling out all these these tricks that a lot of people are doing with specialty malts and whatnot. So we kind of try to drive the train in a more simplistic pattern and just try to hit play brew by the numbers. Um, so, you know, we have a single infusion system just like we did at the Bronx. Um, so it, it, a lot of the actual practical stuff we're doing is the same, but it's just it's making sure um, our salts are right. Our, we use a lot. We kind of try to stick as close to possible to Ren Heinzke boot because, you know, there's, there's reasons that German beer is so good. And it's just the, the attention to detail is, is so key there. So we adjust our, our malts, our uh, pH with acidulated malt. We use sour goot, which if you don't know what that is, it's really cool. Um, yeah, talk, yeah. Talk to me about that. 
Yeah, it's um, so it's a uh, uh, Vireman product you can buy from BSG if anyone's curious. Um, what it is, it's 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 soured wort that's then turned into a malt concentrate. So you just throw a little bit into the uh, the mash tun or the kettle, and it helps you adjust and, and maintain your pH where you need it to be. Um, so you still have your naturally forming lactic acid, which allows it to still be Reinheimsgebot without um, throwing in chemically manufactured lactic acid, which is does the trick. But I think it leaves, to, to, in my opinion, it leaves a little bit of like a chemically uh, manufactured taste and everything. So it's that's just the little details that I think is what makes lager so great and and that's you know that's what how we're able to make it on a three and a half system is it's all right we're trying to brew by the numbers and hit these marks and only use minimal ingredients rather than complicating it and throwing five pounds of carafone 25 pounds of uh special b or or, or whatever you throw yeah. in there it's like no it's pilsner malt and acidulated malt and maybe a little bit of chip for extra protein and sure. that's it yeah. Does that take does that take discipline? Yeah. As a brewer? Um it, I would I would definitely say so. You know, I think um myself not included in this conversation is that like the impulse to to complicate and to, and change and manipulate and try and uh kind of chase this dragon of the perfect beer is always there. Um so you kind of have to remind yourself is like this beer is good. And and you don't there's no reason to make like it perfect because perfect is the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start kind of getting weird and, and experimenting, you kind of tend to lose the plot. And if you get back on track, great, you've succeeded. But sometimes you don't, that experiment you're trying to do to get better doesn't always get you to where you want to be, which then you have to backtrack and kind of just go back to, to the fundamentals of where it used to be. we and I, I say this from experience, we've done this a hundred times with our core brand IPA. Um, we, we used to manipulate it and change it constantly. Um, and there was like a period where I was just, every batch was just, was just okay. And then we kind of went back and refreshed everything and went back to the original method of how we brewed the first batch it was like, this is the best batch I've ever made. <laughs> you know? It's, it's the, it, that's that need to needle and tweak and adjust that really, becomes your own worst enemy um so it's the discipline to like tell yourself to shut up and just make the beer it's going to be good do it the same way over and over again like and and you'll be happy unless unless the beer's not good to be, be, begin with and you know tweak away but if yeah. the beer came out good the first go round, there's no need to to dissect and cut and and trim away any other fat because it's you know it's like a brisket you want a little bit of that fat there those imperfections are kind of, in my opinion, what make certain beers so good. You know, our Pilsner has like this touch of sulfur um, from our the uh, house yeast we use, and I that that's for me that's the driving flavor component that really um, gets me excited about drinking that beer. It's it's a little imperfect, and it gives it the character that makes it so much more interesting to me than if we had like this perfectly clean, like thirty four seventy all Pilsner malt. That, that, that would be, it's a great beer. Those are great beers, but all you get is a, it's a cookie cutter, clean Pilsner. And yeah. it doesn't have enough of that driving force, in my opinion, to make it interesting. It doesn't have that just little thing that's wrong to some people that really kind of makes it interesting. How much does customer feedback way into that because I, I i mean i i like hearing that you're having these conversations in the brew house and i think most brewers do as well but then you know you start here you know you either start looking at sales metrics or you start looking at um what people may be saying at your own bar or you know i hope not but you know on certain online apps um how much it, it sounds like you all have a pretty good sense of self and what you want your beers to be and people have responded well to them, but how much does outside feedback play into what you're doing? Um, it, it used to, I'll, I'll say it, it used to, to hit home a little bit more so than it does now. Um, you know, I, I think hearing, 
hearing criticism in any capacity is always a little hard to like digest. Um, and I think with, with years of experience of getting different inputs back, it's, it's processing and, and deciding, okay, well, this is, this is constructive criticism and this is just, you know, some jerk on the internet who found a keyboard. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's trying to find who's right and who's wrong. And, and, you know, a lot of it's just ignoring it and, and making sure that you're doing well, like you can look at the internet and be like, okay, well, there are five people in a row that said this batch of, of object permanence is awful. Well, all right, well, let's, let's double check that it, it is not actually awful. And these guys are just at a, a beer share, just having too many and, and, you know, sure. maybe not tasting great, or maybe it is a bad can who knows, but you know, you got to make sure the batch itself is still good. So you, you kind of, ha- for me, it's just digesting the information, but then kind of still, you know, taking feedback and, and figuring out how, how to move forward in a direction that makes sense. Um, Cause like the market's always changing. And we, the big thing is we're trying to figure out how to, how to stay re- relevant almost all the time um, without reinventing the wheel every other week. Um, so we kind of try to always, like I said, at the beginning is like we, we chose to do lean into loggers because it was a niche that there were not a lot of people doing in our area. Um, well, now everyone's doing loggers and IPAs. And so it's like, okay, so how do we keep evolving to maintain that interest of people looking at our tap list and be like, well, you don't look like the brewery down the street or in the County over. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of what led us into, we, we recently uh, entered into the English beer style category but specifically only focusing on nitrogenated English styles. Um, so we have like a, a best bitter right now. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, it's, it's listening to everyone and figuring out how, where the trend is going and then trying to get a step ahead of them. And that's like its own juggling act in and of itself. Cause you're going to make, you're going to make mistakes along that way of what makes sense, what works and, and the best you can do is just focus on making good beer and hopefully it'll just, people will follow. I like that. It's uh, again, that sort of takes the restraint and some of the patience as well. I imagine. Um, how the relevance game i think is is coming up more and more these days i mean with with more breweries than ever before in the us and you know everybody sort of scrounging for the same consumer dollars as as craft hasn't necessarily grown in its uh overall overall audience is there i don't know where where do you see the path forward for the brewery and the beers that you that you want to make versus what people are looking for well i think there's a a balance between the two of making what you want you know i I think especially there was a moment in time where people were always saying oh i i only make the beers i want to drink um and i can say there's some truth to a lot of people who said that but you look at their tap list it's like there's again we go back to the ipas i I don't hate them i just it's they're everywhere and ubiquitous so it's it'd be kind of what wash the brewing scene into one category if we make IPAs. Um, but you look at that list, they're like, oh, that guy's only making IPAs. And sure, he might like to brew IPAs, but I guarantee you he wants to drink something else. Yeah. So, you know, trying to go back to that me- mentality and actually executing on it while also being consumer friendly is, um, you know, I think that's that's where we we kind of try to try to s- survive. And it's, and it's listening to other people, like you said, but, um, sorry, I went on a, I feel like I went on a bit of a tangent there, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I lost, I lost the, the, the plot there. <laughs> well, so I, what, what struck me of being at the brewery, right. Was yeah. People come in for, for IPA. Um, I think that that is still by and large the driver for most people on a weekend going to a tap room um no matter where you are unless you're a brewery that only does lagers or only does saisons and something like you know whatever um right most people will come in and they're going to look for something hoppy 
probably something hazy or cloudy. Um, what I was really struck with was the diversity of your list because, you know, you had the English Milds and you had the Lagers and you had the Saisons and you had the IPA, um, which I didn't, uh, I didn't drink, but I'm an outlier. Um, so I guess having diversity on your tap list, aside from the Lagers, has that helped you think branch out? drinkers preferences or drinkers experiences like do do you see people come in who might want the ipa are probably familiar with lagers and might do that as a palate cleanser do you see them ordering saison do you see them ordering the milds do you see them ordering you know some of the other stuff that that you're doing that doesn't fall into the two big mainstream buckets yeah i would i would definitely say so i mean if uh one of my uh, taste room staff mentioned the other day is, um, you know, they've worked at other breweries and he, he mentioned that it's, it's, it's interesting. is like the way that we approach their staff approaches and has conversations with people is really convinces someone to actually like give a Saison a shot and like, you know, the, the care and, and passion that we put into everything allows people to feel more comfortable to be like, okay, well, you know, I liked this beer, let's try something different. What would you recommend? So like, we'll get them to drink. We have our, our house stays on, um, which, you know, I, it's not a, not selling gangbusters, but it's, it's moving a lot better than some of the saisons we used to brew. Um, we have our mixed house, our mixed fermentation peach saison, and people are, you know, much more interested in approaching and t- trying it out because it, the sour thing is, is very much part of our, the common lexicon now. So people are like, do you have a sour? Um, and more often than not, we don't have a kettle sour in that sense. So we're like, well, we don't have a sour, but we have this year aged peach saison that is sour. Um, and so people are much more interested in trying it out. And that kind of community, um, it kind of builds like a community sense of community where people trust in us and it allows them to feel more comfortable to, to continue trying different things. And, and like that kind of is a big driver for us. And I think that's a big driver for the future is like trust and building a community is, is what's going to kind of drive us forward. Um, creating an environment where people want to come hang out. They want to come try di- something different and they just want to meet the, you know, their, their friends are in from out of town and they want, they're like, Oh, we, I know this really cool brewery that interesting beers and, and it's, it's just a great environment and everyone's, creating a fun hospitable environment so so yeah the the thing that struck me about your saison program was that you're serving it in what the the 350 the 375 milliliter green glass bottles were they 375s or five yeah they're 375s um but being served over the bar that way and looking around you know, cause we were there for a couple of hours, uh, as more people came in and were ordering them, seeing them popped up on tables around the tasting room made me want one even more, like made me want to order another one. Um, because it, it is such a, a, a fun visual. Um, there's a certain romanticism that comes with pouring from bo- pouring yourself from a bottle into a glass, um, in a, in a, in a cool setting. And I, I was thinking about, you know, that that old Guinness line of like the best advertisement Guinness has is the person down the bar ordering one and you seeing it being poured. Um, There's something that was very Pavlovian about seeing green glass bottle saisons around the bar. Was that intentional? So the from a an intention standpoint, it was more about the product. Um, you know, I think the uh, I kind of call it the fifth ingredient because um, <clears throat> like Saison DuPont comes in that green glass and the the constant struggle of making anything taste remotely close to Saison DuPont is it doesn't have that slight edge of light struck. Um, so it, it kind of, it was intentional to create this recipe. And then there was the, like you said, the Pavlovian effect of people seeing is like, oh, what's in the bottle? I want to try that. That was unintentional. Um, but obviously seeing the success of it, we've, we've leaned more into it. Um, 
and acknowledge that 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 is something that drives people's attention and it's um you know it's the i call it the espresso martini effect one person orders one <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're ordering nine um and we do that with a lot of different things like we do uh uh bergs and tubes um that's a very much the same thing yeah it's you know nobody nobody bergs alone is what i say um so you know one person orders a, a berg in a tube and the staff always will chime in and be like well i'll do one with you and the next thing you know they're pouring eight and the whole <laughs> bar is, is doing one and uh i found that's that's very much an interesting uh human path uh, that we we like to kind of play into because it's again like i mentioned earlier is the community aspect you know beer is, is meant to be consumed with people over good conversation and creating something that allows you to bond over something as simple as drinking a, a green glass saison, chugging a, a tube of foamy beer with a slightly bitter German digestif is, is, is a strong driver in connecting people um, over something so simple. Yeah. You mentioned es uh, espresso martinis. Um, I know you're also into the cocktail scene and, um, the bars that that serve well-made cocktails as well um before we start talking about the 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 new home for for buttonwoods i'm wondering are there parallels that you're seeing between where beer came from and where it is now versus um the craft cocktail scene or vice versa yeah i mean it's it's, it's interesting um you know a lot uh, there's a uh, nostalgia is is a hell of a drug and um <laughs> It's, it really drives a lot of, of our, our, our consumption habits. Um, I, I'm starting to see people, um, craft cocktails, especially as like people are ordering, uh, cosmopolitans and, um, like I, I, I would, as a, at a young age, my early drinking experience with the Cosmo was pretty much just sex in the city. And it was the, the only people really drinking Cosmos were for lack of a better term were the woo girls. Uh, the girls who would take a shot and go, woo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just in case you didn't know what that was. Um, and so you, the, that, you know, that nostalgia for those older things is, is really driving what people drink um, and how they drink. And that's, and some of it's just really going back to the roots and simplifying things. Like, you know, it's part of why we made a macro light, uh, light lager, like, like the Royal Pony Boy, which is the, uh, Miller High Life homage. It's, it's it's that comfort blanket. You know what you're getting um, in a world of nine thousand beers, uh, ten thousand breweries. You know it's hard to to sift through and find. You know, be comfortable in what you're ordering. So a lot of people tend to be they start they're going back to that. Well, I have a six pack of of this beer in my fridge at all times because I know I like it. Um, and so it's trying to tap into to that that mentality is like, well, okay, well, you, you, you have your core beer, whether it's, whether it's our standard double IPA or single IPA lo Pilsner lager, whatever it is, like we want you to come in and be like, look at the menu and be like, Oh, there's the beer that I like. That's all I'm ordering. And that's fine. You know, it used to be create diversity and, and have something. So, you know, untapped nation of everyone checking in a new thing every five minutes is, is kind of, it's waning in my experience and people just want that nostalgic comfort. I know what I'm getting and I like this beer. So I'm just going to drink this beer all day. And same with cocktails. It's like they, you get one cocktail. If you're having another one, you're getting the same one nine times out of 10. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And it, it, that's could just be us, but yeah, it's just that, that comfort and that familiarity th seems to be, you know, that the routine people are looking for routine again, um, for whatever reason that may be, it's just, they want that the same thing. They want to know what they're getting. They want the right expectations and they want it to be good. So that's kind of what drives what we're, what we're looking at and how we're adding new beers and, and keeping the draft list interesting while comfortable. Yeah. So speaking of comfortable, uh, I really enjoyed sitting in your tap room, uh, in the Cranston location. And, uh, I really, as uh, I was with Andy Crouch, who, 
uh, really thought that we were going to get murdered walking through your parking lot. And as we were going up the staircase uh, on the loading dock to get into your tap room, I really had no idea what was going to be on the other side of those doors and was, I think, probably like most first-time visitors, pleasantly surprised. Um, you've created a really cool, uh, welcoming atmosphere uh, in a, I'm being generous uh, by saying in industrial gravel parking lot. Um, but that home is not for, for, for too much longer, right? No, no, we're, we're very close to, uh, to the transition actually. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're moving to Providence as you're, uh, I feel like building up to her. Yeah. And, uh, yes. And, uh, yeah. And it's, sorry. And I don't mean to malign your, your current home too much, but I mean, it is, it it is, it is a war torn parking lot that looks like it had been shelled pretty heavily um yeah you know during a war it's definitely gotten it's it's been bad admittedly but over the past couple months with the new landlords it's um it's definitely looks a lot worse than usual um the dumpsters lining the loading dock definitely don't help um but yeah i mean it's always been super (laughs) sketchy and i love i love people walking up saying almost half the new people say exactly what you said is like, I thought I was going to get murdered walking up here. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad it doesn't look the same inside as it does outside. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, the, a lot of that credit goes to our tasting room manager. She's done an absolutely stunning job making a warm, welcoming environment that you want to hang out and, and drink beers. And um, she kind of calls it uh European cafe chic, I think is the term she used. Okay. Um, so it's, it's just a lot of eclectic, odds and ends with literally roadside furniture in some aspects. Um, she got into furniture repair or whatever the term is they're using. Um, so that she really leaned in, into that aspect of her life when she was uh, designing the space. Um, so I'll miss that part, but we're, we're moving into a, a much bigger, much bigger space. Um, the tap room alone is going to be bigger than the production and tap room we currently have. Um, it's gonna be 4,500 square feet with a bar and restaurant. Um, so it's a, it's an exciting and daunting and, and, uh, terrifying task, but, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of building that out and we'll have our 10 barrel brew house up, up and running, uh, full kitchen. We have a pizza oven, which we're, we're, we're workshopping pizza soon. So okay. hopefully, that, hopefully that'd be good. Does, yeah, does Rhode part. Island have its own kind of pizza? I, I, I'm not aware. Like, I know that, you know, Boston has the South Shore. Uh, Connecticut has, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, its own kind of pizza. Um, is, yeah. Interestingly uh, enough, like Rhode Island pizza is kind of this, it's almost like a Greek Sicilian style. Okay. Like combo. Like it's, it's, a, it's usually square pies. Um, heavily sauced lots of cheese um and they're really you know there's there's a couple places that really do it and do it well and they're obviously the older places there's like twins and casertas um there's a couple other newer places that do it well as well but i think for the most part the newer pizza places aren't really pushing that forward a lot of places um you know we have we have a place we have a lot of detroit pizza we have a lot of new new haven style pizza um New Haven. Wood that's fired. what I was looking for. I was calling it Connecticut, yeah. but I couldn't place New Haven in my mind in the moment. Yeah, New Haven's in Connecticut. It's, yeah, it's know, a, no, I, I, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you know, Rhode Island pizza doesn't quite have the same um, excitement that some other styles of pizza are doing. So we're trying to like, you know, we it's it's a wood fired pizza oven, so we're really going to lean more closer to like the Neapolitan style. Um, pizzas but you know that's still being workshops and that's a conversation with our our chef and team uh cooking staff so i'm not 100 uh sure where where they're heading yet because it's all depends on their skill and capacity to make good pizza which is the daunting task in rhode island there's a lot of pizza places in rhode island um and admittedly there's some really good ones and there's some really bad ones and plenty in between um so we we have to make sure we're not on the bad end of that that scale (laughs) Yeah. So in moving into a new location, right, there's a chance to 
I don't know, adjust some of the things that weren't working in the past. Um, there's probably a desire to keep so much of what has been working so far. Um, how are you trying to balance or how are how are you balancing so far what you want this new space to be in reconciling with the well-established history that you've already or the reputation and history that you've already created? I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because like, you know, I think a lot of our aesthetic is, was really built by this, the building that we're in. Um, you know, it's, it's, hundred year old Oak timbers everywhere like that. It just, the wood alone creates this warm feeling. Um, and then we're moving into, uh, a fully bricked out with steel beams, uh, everywhere building. So you don't get that same warm, strangely warm industrial feel. Um, we're moving more towards a cold industrial feel. So it's trying to create that warm, welcoming environment is such a, it's a task. Um, you know, we're trying to incorporate, obviously with our name being Buttonwoods, we, we do lean into the the wood part. And um, so it's been, the challenge is making it warm and inviting while dealing with so much more space. Yeah. You know, it's hard, it's hard to make a warm, cozy, comfortable space when you have 30 foot ceilings and 4,500 square feet to spread out. And so it's, that's kind of the big thing is how do we make these infinite, in, intimate little pockets of space um, where you can have those conversations with friends and then also have like readjust the bar so that you can, um, you know, be a part of that, that bar community. Cause that is such a strong driver for us. We have people who literally will not fight over chairs, but they're, they're hovering over the chairs and standing over someone's shoulder to just sit and have those conversations and, and be at the bar. So we want to create that same bar feel in the new space. Um, so we kind of recess the bar. So it, you have this little pocket for, for the regulars who fight over the bar seats. And then you have the rest of the restaurant bar space where it's, you can spread out and have your intimate conversations. So it's just creating a home. It, it, it takes people and it's not the material. So it's trying to forecast how people are going to interact with the space is really the big challenge. No, I get that. Um, I imagine there's going to be a, a, a big run on your place after everybody listens to this, but last day at the current location, hopeful first day at the, at the new one. Uh, we don't know yet. Okay. Um, we're, we're kind of, um, we're waiting on, uh, right now we're sitting and waiting on federal license transfer, which for whatever reason, the TTB is taking longer than usual. Um, so I'm, I'm <laughs> That one, that one's the first hurdle that I, I didn't expect to kind of get over. Um, but you know, the nice part is the space we're moving into is, is a former brewery. So we really just need to slap a co uh, coat of paint on there and refresh the furniture. Um, so the, the transition is pretty quick. We took over in January and assuming we get that federal license in the next week or so, if we're hoping end of March, um, but it's just there's so many questions still left to be answered that I'm like, I hate putting a date on it because there's all it, the old adage of uh, take your timeline, double it and then yeah. double it again. And you might be in the ballpark. Yeah. Uh, I just hear that ringing in my head every time everyone asks me for a date. Um, so I, I'll i simply say we should be open by the spring. Um, but I hope sooner. OK, well, stay tuned to social media for all of that. Mm hmm. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you the green door question and the the premise being on the television show, The Good Place, in the final season, they introduced this concept of a green door where the characters can walk through and be anywhere doing whatever they want to be doing. So if we had a green door on our plane of existence and this conversation ended and you could walk through it and be at any pub or any brewery anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? Who would you want to be with? And what would you like to be drinking? Oh, I forgot to prepare for this question, but I think I have a great <laughs> answer. Well, for me personally, great answer. Um, I, I'm I'm very much this the sentimental type, despite my uh my what my girlfriend would call my hard exterior. Um, I would definitely, 
in all honesty, I would like to be at the the Ondex Brewery. Um, that is one of my personal favorite, like, lagers, breweries of all time. The Zwickel beer is is one of my all-time favorite beers, uh, hands down. And I'd like to be having that beer with my dad. Um, he's my business partner, and I see him all the time. But to kind of have that, like moment where we're not having a business conversation and just enjoying each other's company over great beer is like kind of be the most refreshing thing I can honestly think of. Um, Cause we both work so hard and we have tough conversations and, and you know, we, we fight like cats and dogs over the stupidest shit sometimes, but to have a moment with him again, where it's just, we're not talking about anything other than just, the rest of life going on around us would probably be the greatest thing ever. See, I like that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for being on the show this week. Thanks for thanks. One, thanks for making great beer and having a cool place to drink it. And I'm looking forward to visiting the new spot, but um, two, thanks for, for sharing insight and for doing what you do. I appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully time. I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> no, this was great. This was a lot of fun. What's an under the radar brewing gem that you want more people to know about? Tell me. You can email me. It's John Hall. That's J O H N H O L L at allaboutbeer.com. That's also how you can get in touch with questions, comments, or guest suggestions. A reminder go visit allaboutbeer.com. There you can check out the podcast page, the merch page, and read great new content as well as the archives going back to 1979. Follow All About Beer on social media, at All About Beer. And if you're interested in supporting journalism in the beer space, and we hope you are, you can email us at info at allaboutbeer.com or go to patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. Don't forget, All About Beer has a podcast channel now. Search and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Steal the Spear has new episodes every Monday. The BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And check out probrewer.com each week for original articles from the All About Beer team. As for this show, Mitch Weber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'll be back again to drink beer and to think beer.